Resilience is this idea, this idea of resilience is about bouncing back. So if we think about a Pareto chart where systems or communities or individuals sort of fluctuate, we sort of all do, right? And resilience is our ability to move from here to here. It's really the delta. It's the difference between these two spaces. And so you may think of community resilience as the ability of a community to recover and respond after something happens, disaster or a catastrophe. Individual resilience may be how an individual is able to respond and react to changing circumstances, good or bad. Resilience is a way of thinking about strength. Right? It's about thinking about strength before something happens. Uh, and so it's a really useful model to think about disasters and catastrophic disaster response uh, because it forces us to think way upstream at what builds resilience as opposed to focusing on how to respond to a crisis. A response is, is important, uh, but it doesn't help prevent sort of the long-term consequences of disaster. I think the question to ask in a disaster or in any crisis, and in the Ebola epidemic is a great one, the Ebola pandemic, is what's the difference that makes a difference between places that do it right and places that struggle? And the real lesson we learned, and I think we're still learning the lessons, by the way, we're not done. This is a pandemic that's still very much ongoing. But the initial lessons we learned on the hospital side is that there weren't a ton of differences between the way the situation was handled in hospitals in places like Monrovia, Liberia, and maybe places like here in the U.S. Now, of course, there are differences. We have a lot more resources here in the United States. We dealt with very few patients, four, uh, you know, four to five patients at the time today. Uh, but what the differences that weren't so different were the resilience challenges faced by these hospitals. And there we saw a lot of similarities. Now, I wasn't at Texas Presbyterian, but what we know from what was reported was that they faced some of the same struggles that we faced and that the hospital at JFK in Monrovia continued to face, such as uh, an inability to fully see what was going on around them. We call that a lack of a common operating picture. And that knowledge deficit that results uh, can be a real barrier to sort of action because you don't know what's going on. And in hospitals, it's a particular problem. If you ask people that work in hospitals, they'd say they, day to day, they're not sure what's going on from place to place. The other was that the structures themselves aren't designed in a way to be flexible. They're very static. And so in a crisis where your change is the enabler, right, the ability to flex, that is a resilient trait. And hospitals are bureaucratic organizations that do some things very well, other things they struggle. And uh, change, rapid change, is not usually a characteristic of a bureaucratic organization. And so both hospitals struggled in that way as well. I think both hospitals had a little bit of stigma and fear associated with what they were doing. Interestingly, that played out very differently in West Africa than it did uh, maybe in the U.S., where, but in both cases, they seem to be somewhat paralyzed in the initial response. That led to an inability to detect the disease. So the, uh, seeing a patient come in with a travel history from Africa with symptoms that were suggestive of Ebola and discharging that patient home, it's easy to dismiss that as an error. You know, that, that was just a mistake. But I think it's much more complex than that, right? Because it suggests that there is, some, there is something that's much more complicated and sophisticated about implementing a change in a hospital environment. Mm -hmm. These are not places in which you can just say, well, you know what, I know we do it this way every day, but today we want you to do it totally differently. We want you to start asking about travel history. And when you do that, we want you to be thinking about a new differential diagnosis. That's a big ask of a system. Both facilities struggled with understanding how to make that change. And so again, it's a, you sound like a broken record, but it does come back to agility. And I think that's the biggest lesson we learned. Traditional hospital preparedness has been about how do you respond to something when it happens? And traditionally that for hospitals means instituting an incident command system, putting someone in charge, maybe picking the right color vest to wear, and then doing something, uh, making an evacuation or instituting a plan or calling in people to help drive in the snow or, or whatever it may be. And uh, all of that is important. We'd say it's necessary but not sufficient, right, to respond effectively. So we worked with folks and asked them, how might we think of it differently from stem to stern? And what we got after many, many hours of observation and interviews and design sessions with actual stakeholders, so nurses and doctors and technicians and administrators who do this work every day, 
was the identification of essentially a four-phase model. And that model begins with an intelligence component. That is, how does the system know things? And of course, the system knows what the system watches. Right? So hospital systems know daily revenue, they know readmission rates, they know the things that matter to the business. And so the question can be, what are the resilience factors that a hospital can know that may also promote a better response? So it starts with this idea of intelligence, and then it gets to this idea of decision making. Hospital systems are, by their nature, driven by consensus, they're driven by discussion, they're driven uh, by complexity. And that's important because they're very complex organizations. Then in a crisis we say, to leaders, make unilateral decisions and make them immediately. And we assume that leaders are capable of doing that. And it's our belief after you know, spending a lot of time with these hospital systems that that's just not true. Occasionally a leader may be able to do that. But for the most part, a culture has to be developed in which hospital leaders are able to change on a dime their strategy. Whereas normally, success is achieved by collaboration and consensus. Now what we want you to do is make very fast decisions and not be afraid of being wrong. In a crisis, we assume that a wrong decision is really deadly. But in fact, no decision is what's deadly. It's already bad. Your hospital's already flooded, right? Sitting around and deciding what you're going to do, that's what's going to go get you, you know, go, go, you know, for lack of a better word, sort of put you under, right? What, what needs to happen is that pivot. So that's the second model, and that's really hard to do. The third is the traditional response. So once you've identified and you can see it, you've made the decision how to respond, we know how to do that pretty well. And then finally, instead of thinking about recovery, which is the usual words we use, how do you think about rebounding? Sort of using this plastic sort of plasticity model where it's a rubber band, right? How do you think about rebounding back to the state you were at? Or maybe rebounding even better than you were when you started? I believe there are probably three things nursing schools could do to promote this idea of resilience to disasters. The first is to recognize that the most important resilience factor in any crisis is the health of the population. And nurses, this is what we do. We are about the health of populations. So whether that nurse is a public health nurse working out in a rural area or an ICU nurse working in a hospital, keeping folks healthy makes them more likely to survive crisis events. So the first thing we can do is keep doing what we're doing. The second thing is to recognize that this is a skill. Understanding how to think about crisis is not natural. And in fact, it's counterintuitive for most people. Think about things like triage. We normally triage based on who's the sickest. That assumes we have an infinite amount of resources to take care of you. In a disaster, we may have the opposite. We may have very few resources, meaning we may only be able to take care of those most likely to recover, meaning that some of the sickest have to stay. So teaching nursing students those skills, even if they don't remember them precisely five years from now, builds a muscle memory for flexibility and agility, the very things that we know are resilient. And I think the third thing, and something that, that you all are doing here clearly, is inviting a dialogue. That simply having the discussion, uh, placing this in the framework, that this is something that is nursing's area. Uh, I always remind, I mean, look, we're a profession born of catastrophe, right? Florence Nightingale was in the Crimean War. Uh, Claire Barton in the U.S. was a Civil War battlefield nurse. We are genetically predisposed to knowing what to do in a crisis. Over the years, we've demagivered ourselves a little bit. So discussions like this help us refocus and say, what is it about nursing? What's our role? And our role is to heal and comfort and cure. And uh, it's something that we can do in crisis or not. I think people are worried often that if they focus on things like resilience and preparedness, it's going to be expensive and they're going to lose money. And our usual answer is, well, it's expensive not to prepare for a disaster, right? I actually think that's the wrong question. The right question is, is what can you do in your organization to drive value every single day that will also increase the resilience of your organization in crisis? Hospitals of the future are going to be paid based on the health of a population in their catchment area. And if we know that the health of a population is the most important determinant of post-disaster health, which it is, then it makes perfect sense to marry the hospital's health promotion activities and reconceive of them as disaster preparedness efforts, which they are. One could imagine a hospital really looking way upstream and saying, we could figure out in our hospital how to accept thousands of people, but wouldn't it be smarter to maybe figure out how in the community to absorb those patients? And what could we do to facilitate things in the community? So in that way, I think hospitals could save money. The biggest thing I'm not asked that I should have, should be asked, is why aren't healthcare providers doing this? See, preparedness has become the purview of other folks. All, by the way, exceptionally talented, good people we need to work with this, right? But meanwhile, nurses and doctors have largely become the recipients of these sorts of things. And I think the one thing I haven't been asked, which I would is, and you did, which is, what can nurses do? I think nurses can recognize that this is nursing. This is nursing. 
And it's the kind of nursing that doesn't save one life at a time, it saves millions.